If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe to the channel. And if you're enjoying these stories, there's a link below to buy me a cup of coffee. This is the Hasidic Story Project with Barack Holman, podcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. This podcast is sponsored by listeners just like you. To become a supporter of this podcast, please go to HasidicStory.com. H-A-S-I-D-I-C Story.com. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. You'll never know. Shalom Aleichem, my sweetest friends. Purim is coming. And so this week, I have for you one very long Purim story. And then at the end, I'll include all of the Purim stories from previous years. For anybody that listens on long trips, you will have a very long episode to listen to. Be'ezat Hashem. But before we begin, as is our custom, unfortunately, that there's a war still going on here in Israel. I want to dedicate this episode to the continued success and safety and health of all of our soldiers, wherever they are. The refuah of all of those that have been injured. The returning of all the hostages, safe and healthy and whole. The comforting of those that lost loved ones. The continued unity of the Jewish people here in the land of Israel and everywhere around the world. It was the Purim Suda, the meal that we have on the holiday of Purim, in the house of the Hele Gabal Shem Tov, the great Rebbe. And all the Hasidim could see that the Baal Shem Tov was in a very good mood. And at some point he announces, this is a Zman Mesugal, this is an auspicious moment, a favorable one. Anyone who needs anything in particular should ask right now, and I will bless them if I can. And so all of the Hasidim came before the Baal Shem Tov, and he's blessing each one. And then word spread quickly throughout Mejibuz, and people that weren't direct Hasidim of the Baal Shem Tov also came for brachot. And the Baal Shem Tov would ask each one, do you need money? Do you need health? Do you need shidduch? Do you need to go on your Torah learning? Whatever it is. And there was a wealthy Jew, his name was Faibish, who appeared before the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov says, what can I do for you, my sweetest friend? Do you need riches? Do you need health? Do you need power? What is it that you need? And Faibish said to the Rebbe, Holy Rebbe, I'm already a wealthy man. I don't need more money. And Baruch Hashem, I'm healthy. But I'm getting older. And my wife and I never had children. And there'll be nobody to continue my name or inherit my money after I leave this world. I'd like you to bless me, please, Rebbe, with a child. And the Baal Shem Tov looked into the heavenly realms, and he saw that were this man and his wife to have a child, that child would be a thief. And not just be a thief, but be one of the biggest thieves there ever was. So the Baal Shem Tov says to Faibish, If you knew that your son was going to be a criminal, would you still want a blessing for this child? And the wealthy Jew thinks for a minute, and he says, Well, Rebbe, will he one day do tshuva? Maybe when he gets older? And the Baal Shem Tov said, Yes. He is going to be a thief and be sinful and be wicked until two years after he's married, and then he will do tshuva. So Faibish says, Okay, Rebbe, I'd like the bracha, please. And the Baal Shem Tov said, But it's not so simple, my friend. If you want to have a son, you have to be prepared to lose all of your money. You'll become a beggar, and not only that, you will die before your son is born. Think about it. Do you agree to these conditions? And Faibish thought it over and he said, Yes. What's my life worth without children? The Baal Shem Tov said, Well, that's very easy for you to make that decision, but you need to speak with your wife before you come back with an answer. After all, she's going to have to raise the child by herself. So go back right now and ask her what she wants to do. So Faibish went back home and he told his wife of the deal with the Baal Shem Tov that this was probably their only opportunity to ever have a child. And he's willing to give up his riches and even give up his life so that she would have a son, something that he couldn't give to her. And even though it broke her heart to think that in a sense she's exchanging her husband for a son and also to lose all their wealth, she agreed. And the Baal Shem Tov blessed them. Now Faibish had left out that the Baal Shem Tov said that their son was going to be a great thief. He figured, what's the point? He doesn't want to cause his wife anxiety for no reason. So during that year, Faibish's wife got pregnant. And when she was about six months pregnant, he made a great investment in business and lost all of his money because the person that he invested with was a fraud, and there was nothing actually there. And he understood that this was the blessing of the Baal Shem Tov. And slowly they started selling all of their furniture, and all of their clothes, and everything. And when Faibish started walking around begging for money, 
It was simply too much for him. He was heartbroken and he got sick. And a month before his wife gave birth, he passed away. Of course, there was a large funeral because everybody knew that Feibusch was wealthy and influential and he had helped many people over the years. And a month later, his widow gives birth to a boy <laughs> and she names him after her husband, the deceased father, Feibusch. And of course, the mother loved her son dearly and she stayed with him 24-7. She would do anything for him and took care of him all the time. And even though it was heartbreaking that her husband had passed away and they were impoverished, she was very joyful for her son. And when he was three years old, she enrolled him in the local cheder, and she would take him every morning and bring him home in the evening. And during the day, she would work in the homes of wealthy townspeople, doing whatever odd jobs they had so that she could make a little bit of money to feed her and little Feibish. And in the early years, Feibish lived a very sheltered life. All he knew was the home that he grew up in and the narrow passages to get to the cheder. And he'd never tasted anything except for simple vegetables. His mother would make stews with onions and potatoes. She would bake bread and they had occasionally milk. And this was his diet and this is all he knew. And so he didn't dream about anything else. But one day, Feibish and his classmates from the cheder are walking through the marketplace and each kid has a little coin that their parents gave them. And they're walking around looking at the different foods that the vendors in the market have to sell. Beautiful red apples, all kinds of pastries, fruits, candies, sweets and nuts. And since Feibish didn't have any money of his own, each of his friends gave him a bite of the apple or a taste of the pastry. And Feibish had never tasted anything like this in his entire life. The next day, Feibish didn't have to wait for his friends. He went on his own to the marketplace and he's looking at the piles of fruits, candies, pastries. And now he didn't just want the simple foods that his mother made. He desired the delicacies in the marketplace. And he found that it was very easy to just linger around, waiting for one of the vendors to be busy and then snatch a pastry or a sweet apple. He would put it in his pocket and eat it later. And sometimes he even shared it with his friends. Anytime anyone was suspicious of him, he was such a good liar. Nobody ever believed that he actually stole anything. And so he would go to the cheder in the morning and study Torah, and the teachers didn't suspect anything. And then in the afternoon when they had a break, he would go to the marketplace and steal some food. And his mother was the first one to notice, because Feibish wasn't eating the vegetables that she cooked for him. She of course didn't know that he had filled up on fruits and pastries in the marketplace. But at some point, she got upset because he wasn't eating the food. And she said, you know, I work all day in order to make just enough money for us to eat. And I prepare this food and put it in front of you. And you don't eat it? Why not? And he said, dear mother, it has nothing to do with you. Please don't be angry with me. But I've tasted delicacies that are much better than the foods that you make. And I'm not upset at you at all. It's just I can't eat these simple foods anymore. My palate has grown. And she said, but I work all day. And he said, you know what? My dear mother, you've taken care of me my whole life. And now that I'm 11 years old, it's time for me to support you. I'm going to take care of myself and you. And his mother didn't know what to think. How is her 11-year-old son going to take care of them? And from that time on, Feibish went every day to the market. He would take whatever foods he needed. And he was so good at stealing that nobody could catch him, even though the vendors were watching him all the time. They knew whenever this young boy came to the market, somehow they were missing their best fruits and vegetables and pastries, but nobody saw him doing it so nobody could catch him. Finally, the vendors in the market got together and they said, listen, we have to do something. I'm staring at my pile of apples and I notice that my best apples are gone and I don't even know how it happens. This boy is clearly stealing from us. Let's go to the Baal Shem Tov and ask him what to do. And so a delegation of the vendors from the marketplace went to the Hele Gabal Shem Tov and he listened to them. And he said to them, don't worry, I'll talk with the boy and I'll make sure he doesn't steal from you anymore. I promise you there won't be anything missing from your stalls anymore. And so the vendors left. The Baal Shem Tov asked his Gabai to go bring Feibish. And Feibish shows up at the Baal Shem Tov and the Baal Shem Tov says, what's going on? Why are the vendors in the market coming and complaining about you? You steal from these poor people that have nothing how can you do this? And Feibish says, but Rebbe, I can't help myself. My mother and I are poor. We have nothing. And all they take is just enough food to feed us. We're not supposed to starve, are we? 
The Baal Shem Tov says, but you're not allowed to steal. And you're stealing from poor people who can't afford it. So Fibish thinks to himself, huh, I'll have to start stealing from rich people who for sure can afford it. But then he thought, they have guards and they have dogs and they have safes and they have fences and gates and doors and locks. And how am I going to get into their homes? And the Baal Shem Tov sees this thinking going on in Fibish's head. And he says, Fibish, clearly you were born with a natural inclination for stealing. But you really need to work on controlling yourself. Try working a job and making money that way instead of stealing from other people. And Fibish said, okay, Rebbe, I'll do my best. And I promise I won't steal from the marketplace anymore. And that night, as the entire town of Mejibuz was sleeping, <laughs> Fibish crawled out of bed and left his house and went into the center of town. And he went to one of the stores in the business section and tried the door. And of course it was locked, but Fibish, who'd never picked a lock in his life, took a little piece of metal and stuck it inside. And to his amazement, the lock opened. He tiptoed inside, found the cash box, and took exactly the amount of money that he and his mother needed, and nothing more. He went back out the front door and locked the door. He took so little money that the next day the vendor didn't even realize the money was gone. But then the next night at midnight, Fibish got up went into the commercial district, picked another store, picked the lock, took only as much money as he and his mother needed, and left. And before long, all of the store owners were noticing that every night someone was missing a few rubles. And all the shopkeepers got together and they realized that they were all missing a similar amount. They figured if they were thieves and they were able to enter the stores so easily, they'd better get a watchman to sit and watch all night. And they hired a watchman and he sees Fivish coming at one or two o'clock in the morning. And he sees him just walking in the street, whistling. <whistles> Not doing anything. And Fibish had no problem. Even with the watchman watching him, he was able to break into the stores and steal whatever he needed. So the storekeepers realized this isn't going to work. They went to the Baal Shem Tov and they said, Rebbe, we can't figure it out. We all have locks. We all have cash boxes. We hired a watchman. We see there's a boy that's walking around at night, but we never saw him steal anything. We don't know what to do, Rebbe. You have to help. And when Fibish comes to the Baal Shem Tov, he says, listen, Fibish, I know that you're not stealing more than you just need. And that is, in a sense, controlling yourself like I asked you. But you're making the life of the people here in Mejibuz miserable because nobody can sleep at night. They know you're stealing even if they're watching you. And you realize if you actually get caught, Fibish, because you're stealing from so many people here in Mejibuz, they're going to put you in prison and you might spend the rest of your life there. I think it's time for you to make a clean, honest living so you won't have to steal and you won't have to take from other people's money. Please, Fibish, whatever you do, Fibish, just don't do it here in Mejibuz. And so Fibish was confused. He didn't know what to do. And he told his mother that he's going to have to leave town, but that he'll send back money for her. He was going to try to find some work. But you know, stealing is a lot easier than working. And he found the job. And it wasn't easy work. And at the end of the day, he got paid a small amount of money. And he says to his employer, what is this? And the employer says, what do you mean? This is an honest day's wages. And Fibish thought to himself, wow, some people are real suckers. They're willing to do back-breaking work all day for this small amount of money? He said, forget it. I'm going back to stealing. And he started walking around, and everywhere he went, he would steal food, he would steal some money, just enough for himself. And one day, he's out at night in a town, about to break into a store, when he sees there's a band of thieves watching him. And they say to him, what are you doing? And he said, well, I just steal whatever I need. And they said, ah, you know how to steal? Okay, we have a little thieves union here. Okay, we all steal together. You steal, we steal. We put all of our money together, and then we get rich together. What do you think about joining us? We figured, sure. Now, in the beginning, the thieves didn't trust him because he was just a novice. But when he came back every night with money, and not all of them were successful in doing that, they quickly began to admire him. And it didn't take long for him to become the leader of the Gang of Thieves, because he was the most successful of all of them. They started asking him, Fibish, where do we break into? How do we break the lock? How do we hide ourselves? How do we get away? And Fibish began to come up with bigger and bigger plans, until eventually he had a well-oiled machine, and they were stealing from the wealthiest people in Ukraine. 
He told the thieves we have to move our headquarters deep into the forest. And they even dug an underground cave, covered it up with grass so that nobody could find them. And under his authority, where the thieves behaved as if they were soldiers and Fibish was their general, they were holding raids on the estates of the wealthiest landowners in all of Ukraine and Russia. And no one could catch them. They were always ready with the fastest horses <laughs> in well-greased wagons. And no one seemed to be able to stop them. This went on for nine years, with Fibish leading the gang of thieves. And they collected an absolute fortune. In the beginning, he was sending money back to his mother. But at some point, he forgot about her. Of course, he didn't learn Torah anymore. All he cared about was stealing money. And then, he started to have some strange dreams. In the beginning, he didn't really pay attention to them, but they came every night. It was an old man with a white beard that appeared in the dreams, and he kept warning Fibish, My son, please, my soul has no rest in the world to come because of what you're doing. You have to do tshuva, my son. Please, before it's too late, leave the thieves and come back to a life of Torah and mitzvot. And Fibish heard these words every night in his dreams, and it got to the point where he couldn't ignore it anymore. So the next night he has a dream, and this man appears in the dream, and he says to the old man, how am I supposed to leave my band of thieves? They're like my children. They look up to me for every move. I'm their leader, and they admire me and respect me. So the old man comes up with a plan. He says, tell them that you've guided them for many years, and it's time for them to prove their worth. Can they steal without you? And can they make sure that they wouldn't get caught by the police? My guess is they're not very good thieves, and they'll all get caught. And when they do, you'll be free. And when you are, don't go back to Mezhibuz, but rather go to Berdichev, where your bride, your future wife, is waiting for you. Fibish woke up in the middle of the night, but he couldn't fall back asleep. He was working on a plan to escape this life of being a thief. And when the sun rose, <coughs> Fibish called all the thieves together. He said, gentlemen, it's time for you to go out on your own. Just for today, I want to see what you can do without my guidance. I've taught you well. Now everybody go and steal and come back here as usual. And let's see if you're able to be successful without me. And the thieves were quite excited by this challenge because they'd been together for many years. And they all went off on their own ways and Fibish remained in the camp. And he said to himself, I'm going to wait here and see if they come back. If they do, I'll know it was just a dream. And if they don't, it'll be a sign from heaven that I am released from being a thief. And one day passed and none of the thieves came back. And the second day, three, four days, a whole week, and none of his men returned. And Fibish understood that they'd been caught. And so he took all of the stolen loot, all of the jewelry, and all of the candlesticks, and all of the money, and all of the fur, and everything they'd stolen, and put it in the back of a carriage, and headed to Berdichev, as the man in his dream had told him to do. And when he entered Berdichev, he went to a kosher hotel, and he took the finest room, and he went and got new clothes, and cleaned himself up. And then he heard a voice in his head say to him, It's been a long time since you learned Gemara. Why don't you go to the Beit Midrash and learn a little bit? And Fibish went to the Beit Midrash and he sat down at a table, opened up a Gemara, and found to his shock and surprise, he was able to understand what was written there. Of course, because he'd gone to Cheder and he had a Jewish education. And he got so excited from his learning, even though they were closing up the Beit Midrash for the night, he asked the Gabbai if he could take the book back to his room. And the Gabbai says, sure, just bring it back in the morning. Of course, the Gabbai saw how excited Fibish was in his learning. And when he came back to his room in the hotel, he opened the Gemara and started singing a song as he's learning, just like he learned when he was a boy. The more he tasted the words of the Gemara, the sweeter it was to him. And he found himself staying up all night and all day, just wanting to learn more and more. And he gets so into learning that the other guests in the hotel came to the owner and complained. And the innkeeper went to Fibish and he said, can you keep it down a little bit? You're disturbing the other guests. And Fibish says, listen, I'm very wealthy. I'll pay for all the rooms in the inn. I just want to be able to stay here and learn. And so the next day, the innkeeper told everyone all the rooms are full. And Fibish was able to learn without anyone bothering him. And the innkeeper was quite happy because he just had to take care of one person. And he got all this money. 
And this went on for a few months, and the innkeeper sees Fibish learning day and night. And so he says to Fibish, what do you think about me finding you a wife? The innkeeper figured he'd make some money as the Shadchan, as the matchmaker. And Fibish, remembering from the dream that the old man said his wife would be waiting for him in Berdichev, encouraged the innkeeper to find him a wife. The first person he went to was the rabbi of Berdichev. And he said, Rabbi, I have a young man staying with me. He's a Torah scholar. He spends day and night learning, and he's also very wealthy. He paid for the whole inn so that nobody would disturb him. And he's a true mensch. He says, yes, sir, and please and thank you. And he's really a very special person. What do you think about a match for your daughter? And the rabbi says, hmm, very interesting. Well, tell the young man to come here. I want to meet him. And so Fibish goes to the rabbi of Berdichev. And the rabbi interviews Fibish. And he tells the innkeeper, well, he is truly everything you say. All I have to do is ask the rabbi of Mejibuz what he knows about this young man and his family. And if everything's okay, I'm willing to make the match. But the moment that Fibish heard that the rabbi was going to contact the rabbi of Mejibuz, he simply got up and left. And he said, I'm not interested in the shidduch. But the innkeeper was not ready to give up. He wanted his money. And he wanted to see Fibish married. So he started going house to house to the wealthiest Jews in town. And the same thing happened. People were very impressed with Fibish, with his learning, with his charm, with his money. But when they said they're going to make inquiries in Mejibuz, Fibish just said, I'm not interested. And then he realized this wasn't going to happen in Berdichev. He said, I'll go to Vilna. In Vilna, people are rich and sophisticated, and I'll find the right person for me there. And he told the innkeeper he's going to be leaving the next day. But the innkeeper said, wait, wait, I have one more idea for you. So he says, there's a local tailor here, and he has three daughters, and I'm sure he's a very simple person. He won't ask you any questions. Come, let's go. And so Fibish allowed himself to be dragged to the tailor, and the tailor interviews Fibish, and he says, okay. And Fibish says, you're not going to ask about my childhood or my family or anything like that? And he said, no, you look like a good person. That's good enough for me. And before the shidduch was finalized, the tailor says to Fibish, I'd like to talk with you in private if you don't mind coming outside. And they went outside to a field and they continued walking deep into the forest. And they kept walking and walking until they actually reached the other side of the forest. And standing there was an old man that looked very much like the old man in Fibish's dreams. And the old man says, Shalom Alechem, to the tailor and to Fibish. And he starts giving a full account of Fibish's life from the day he was born until today. And Fibish stood there with his mouth hanging open and his body shaking, wondering, first of all, who was this old man? And second, how did he know everything about him? The tailor turns to Fibish and he says, don't worry, my friend. Your past will be a heavily guarded secret. You should know that I am one of the Lamed Vav Tzadikim of this generation, and I knew that you were meant to be my daughter's husband, and so I made sure not to accept any other offers until you showed up. And then Fibish looks at the old man, and he says, and who are you? And the old man says, Fibish, I'm your father, and you are my son, and you are named after me. I was given the merit, the schut, to come back in this world temporarily, to apologize for all of the pain that I put you through by not being around to be your father and to guide you. But now I'm here, my son, and I'm begging you, please, do tshuva. Stop stealing. You don't understand, my son. It's a matter of life and death for you. You're going to get married now to the tailor's daughter, and this is your chance to stop your transgressions. Once and for all, we learn that when a person does tshuva, all of their transgressions are turned into mitzvot. And then, Fibish the father started walking into the forest and disappeared. And the tailor and Fibish went back home. And on their walk back home, the tailor says to Fibish, I have to share with you another secret. I know that my final day is coming. And when I leave this world, everyone's going to sit shiva for me. And then you will be the head of my family because you will be my son-in-law. And there won't be any man left in this family but you. It will be your responsibility to support my family and to marry off my other two daughters. But you must do this from an honest place and not stealing. And I promise you that Hashem will be with you. And they went back to the tailor's run-down, humble home, and they wrote up the engagement contract. 
And a few weeks later, plans were being made for the wedding, and it was a beautiful but modest, simple wedding. And when the Sheva Brachot, the seven days of blessings after the wedding, were over, the tailor calls Fibish over to him. He says, do you remember when we were walking in the forest? My time is drawing near, and soon I'm going to leave this world. But Fibish, I need you to promise me, give me your word that you will take care of my family. And when I'm gone, you will continue on the true and straight path of serving Hashem. And Fibish gave his hand to the tailor and promised. And that morning, everyone was shocked when the tailor did not wake up. And he was buried, and they sat shiva. And now Fibish had to figure out how he was going to support his wife and him, and his widowed mother-in-law, and his two sisters-in-law, and marry them off. And he realized he had a great deal of wealth from all the stealing that he and his gang had done. And he decided that he would invest the money rather than stealing anymore. And he opened a store in Berdichev and put the finest quality goods in his store. And all of the local noblemen came with their wives and their friends and bought from Fibish. And Fibish became very wealthy. He kept reinvesting in his business and eventually opened up other stores. And he became one of the wealthiest and influential men in the whole area. And all of his friends were the Gentile noblemen. And they would invite him to their parties. And slowly, Fivish forgot about his father-in-law and the promise that he'd given to him. He stopped keeping Torah and mitzvot. He cut off his payas and trimmed his beard. He stopped covering his head. And he would party every night with his Gentile nobleman friends. And once Fibish was invited to a big social event that was on Shabbos afternoon, and it was quite far from his home, and in the morning he had one of his servants hitch up two horses to a carriage, and then he himself was going to drive himself to the party. And he's driving for many, many miles, and there's no sign of anyone around. And eventually, on the road, in the distance, he sees a Jew. As he got closer, he realized that the Jew was none other than his deceased father-in-law. And the horses stopped. The carriage came to a halt. The Lamed Vav Taylor, he says to Fibish, Don't you realize that today is Shabbos? And Fibish didn't get a chance to answer. Because the tailor went over and removed one of the wheels from the carriage and disappeared. And there Fibish was, in the middle of nowhere, with a carriage with three wheels which obviously wasn't going anywhere. And so he sat there waiting for someone to help. He was sitting and sitting and sitting and nobody was coming. And eventually the sun set and it became dark and Fibish was all alone and he didn't know what to do. But by the light of the moon, Fibish could see somebody was walking towards him and it was again his father-in-law. And he said, my dear son-in-law, why did you break your oath to me? You gave me your word that you would live a life of Torah and mitzvot. And Fibish was so embarrassed, he didn't have anything to say. He remained silent. The tailor said, Fibish, you have nothing to say for yourself? I'm giving you one more chance. Here's your carriage wheel. You can go to the party, but you cannot touch any of the food or alcohol there. You will be ashamed and you will be embarrassed. But that's the only way that you can be saved from a terrible fate in the world to come. And with these words, the tailor put the wheel back into the axle and disappeared. And Fibish continued to the party. And when he arrived, the noblemen were happy to see him. They said, Fibish, finally! Why are you so late? And he said, well, I met my father-in-law on the way. And he tried to stop me from coming here because it was Shabbos. And the friends looked at him and they said, Fibish, you came here drunk already? What kind of strange thing is that for you to say? Your father-in-law passed away. So they brought him lots of food and some wine and pushed it all aside. A beautiful young woman came and sat on his lap, and he pushed her aside as well. The nobleman couldn't understand what's going on with Fibish. This was not the Fibish that they knew. So they sent over the finest dishes and the most beautiful women, and he pushed them all away. Then the nobleman got angry at him. They said, what kind of spoil sport are you? You came here just to ruin our party? Then they started making fun of him, and eventually they kicked him out. They said, we're here to have fun, and you're boring and not fun. Get out of here. And not only do we not want to see you at our parties anymore, we're not going to buy from your stores. No nobleman anywhere in this area will ever set foot in your stores again. Get out of here, Fibish. Pooh! And Fibish went into his carriage, ashamed and embarrassed, and he went back home. And when he reached the crossroads, 
Phibish's father-in-law was standing, waiting for him again. And he said to Phibish, get out of the carriage. And then his father-in-law hit the horses, and they took off. And he said to Phibish, grab my coat. And Phibish did as he was told. And the tailor said a holy name of Hashem. And they traveled the whole distance from Berdichev to Mejibuz in a few seconds. And Phibish realized he was back home in Mejibuz. And the tailor said, go straight to the Baal Shem Tov. He's waiting for you. And when Phibish walked into the home of the Baal Shem Tov, he was sitting having a Malava Malka. He was having the meal that we make after Shabbos. And he was too scared to walk into the Baal Shem Tov's house. One of the Gabayim says to Phibish, what are you doing here? What do you want? He said, I want to join the Baal Shem Tov. And when the Baal Shem Tov looked up and saw Phibish, he said, Phibish, come in. Come sit down. He said, go wash your hands and eat something. And so Phibish washes his hands. And he said, Hamotzi. And the Baal Shem Tov said to Phibish, eat up, because the next week you're going to fast. Every day of the week, you can drink water at night. But during the day, no food will touch your lips until Shabbos comes. And he did as he was told. And on Friday night, he had his first meal since the previous Motzi Shabbos and ate all three meals of the Baal Shem Tov. And that Motzi Shabbos at Malava Malka, the Baal Shem Tov said to Phibish, you're going to stay with me now for an entire year. Each week you will fast and you will only eat on Shabbos. And Phibish accepted that this was his path of doing tshuva, of repentance. And each week he fasted and he only ate on Shabbos for the entire year. And he stayed with the Baal Shem Tov and did everything the Rebbe said. And by the end of the year, the Lamed Vav Taylor says to the heavenly court, Look at my son-in-law's soul. It's as pure as the day he was born. There isn't a single blemish remaining. Now he deserves to be called Reb Fibish. But as you know, my friends, there's an evil energy in the world. Ki asa. Because Hashem made juxtaposing energies. And the negative energy in the world, which is sometimes called the Samech Mem, or Satan, or Sitra Acha, or all kinds of names, came to the heavenly court and said, Phibish's tshuva should not be accepted until I get a chance to test him. And of course the Baal Shem Tov heard this, and he said to Phibish, that Moti Shabbos, tonight you're not going to eat Malava Malka. And Phibish simply nodded his head. He went straight to the Beit Midrash, took out a Gemara, sat down and started learning. And a little while later, a man came into the Beit Midrash. And he says to Phibish, what are you doing here? And you said, what do you mean? I'm learning. He said, but I can see you didn't have Malava Malka. Aren't you a good Jew? Everyone makes a Malava Malka. And Phibish said, I would love to have Malava Malka, but my Rebbe told me, no Malava Malka. And if that's what he said, even though it pains me, the words of the Baal Shem Tov are more precious to me than a Malava Malka. And the Samech Mem was very excited. And he said, that's very impressive that you want to have a Malava Malka. And our sages tell us that a person merits many wondrous blessings for doing it. Come, wash. And the Samech Mem pulls out a beautifully fresh, baked, round loaf of white challah. And the smell was so amazing. And he says to Fibish, come, have a bite. No, 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 Fibish said, I can't. The Baal Shem Tov said, I can't. The Samech man said, but your Rebbe only said that you're not allowed to eat with him at his table. He didn't prevent you from eating here in the Beit Midrash. Come, you can just take one bite. That's all you have to do for fulfilling the requirement of Malava Malka. And you know, Fibish had been fasting for a whole year. Even though he ate on Shabbos, he was always hungry. And his stomach is rumbling. And he says to the man, you know, before I eat, I have to wash my hands. And so he got up and went to wash his hands, but there was no water in the basin. He thought that was strange because just a few minutes before, when he walked into the Beit Midrash, he'd wash his hands. And the Samech Mem says, what do you need water for? Don't you know the halacha is? If there's no water, you can just wrap the bread and eat it like that. And then Fibish understood. This wasn't just a person. This was clearly the negative energy in the world coming to trip him up. And Fibish ran for the door. But the stranger grabbed him by the belt. And Fibish unfastened his belt and continued running. And the Samech Mem ran after him, trying to overtake him. And then suddenly Fibish sees the mikvah. He opens the door. He sees the man is behind him. And realizing that he has no other choice, Fibish jumps into the water with all of his clothes on. The Samech Mem raises his hands up and he says, I give up. Clearly, this man is willing to go through such lengths not to eat before washing his hands, which is just a rabbinical commandment. For sure, I won't be able to conquer him. 
And the Baal Shem Tov had been meditating with his eyes closed this whole time, watching the whole scene unfold. And even though he would have started the Malava Malka a long time ago, he was waiting. And then he says to his Gabbai, come with me. The two of them went to the mikveh, and they saw Fibish laying there, almost lifeless. They pulled him out, and after many tries, they were able to get the water out of Fibish's lungs. And he sat up, and the Baal Shem Tov said, My sweetest friend Fibish, you have withstood the last trial, demonstrating that you're willing to give up your life even for rabbinical commandment. So now come and wash and eat Malava Malka with me. You have completed your path of tshuva, and you may return home to your wife. Now you are a new person, and your old ways are gone forever. And Baruch Hashem, Fibish was fortunate enough to live out the rest of his days in wealth, with many children and grandchildren, who grew up to be God-fearing, Torah-observant, and joyful Jews. And on his final day, when Fibish was about to leave this world, he had a huge smile on his face, knowing that he had truly earned his place in the world to come. That was quite a long story, my sweetest friends, even for me, but I really enjoyed telling it. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Thank you for listening, my friends. I want to thank all of the supporters of the podcast, and especially one, Holy Brother Avraham, from the Chesed family here in the Holy City of Jerusalem. I know he's a very loyal listener, so thank you for listening, Avraham, with you and your father. And everyone else, thank you for all of your contributions and your kind words. And I hope you have a beautiful Purim. Remember, Purim is holier than Yom Kippur, but you have to be able to tap into the holiness amongst all of the nonsense and drinking and foolishness. There Hashem hides His greatest secrets. And I'll share with you a secret in how to tap into the holiness of Purim. You have to bless your fellow Jews. When you see somebody, say to them, What do you need? Do you need wealth? Do you need a shidduch? Do you need health? Do you need to grow in your Torah learning? And you simply bless them. Hashem, please bless this person with wealth so they can use their wealth for helping their fellow Jews, for doing mitzvot, and for coming closer to you, Basimcha, with joy. I promise you, you do that, and you'll have the highest Purim ever. Amen! Amen, Amen, brother! If you appreciate my work, my sweetest friends, please consider sending in a contribution for the podcast. I put out these episodes every week, and an episode like this takes me well more than 10 hours to produce. Every contribution is sincerely appreciated, and so are all the comments. So here I have for you all of the stories from previous years. In the end, this is going to be a very long episode. So enjoy, my sweetest friends, and we'll be back with more stories next week.
Wow, my sweetest friends, the great, holy, most special holiday of Purim is coming up next week. Many years ago, I decided to figure out what is this great secret of Purim. I started with drinking too much for many years, and I realized that the mitzvah is not to get drunk on alcohol. The mitzvah is to get drunk on Purim. How does a person get drunk on Purim? Well, here's a story that my rabbi of blessed memory, my friend and mashpia, Reb Shalom Brat, like to tell every year around Purim time. It's a story that he heard from his rabbi, Reb Shlomo Karlbach. In the town of Koznitz, with the great tzaddik, the Magid of Koznitz, Rabbi Sail, there was one beggar whose name was Pinchas, and he was so poor, always down on his luck. Nothing ever seemed to work out for Pinchas, as much as he tried. He tried working for other people, but it didn't last. He tried starting businesses, but they never made any money. In the meantime, he and his wife had more and more children, and having no choice, he went around begging, and he owed money everywhere. And now it came Purim time, and he went into town, and he listened to the Megillah reading by the Rebbe. And after the Megillah reading, everybody's coming to the Rebbe for a bracha, and giving over Mishlochei Manot, the food gifts that we give one another on Purim. And Pinchas, the beggar, he comes to the Magid, and he says to him, Rebbe, can you please give me a bracha? It's Purim. And the Rebbe says, sure, Pinchas, where's my Mishloch Manot? He said, Rebbe, maybe you didn't hear, but I'm a beggar. I don't have any money. I'm so poor, we don't even have any food at home. And the Rebbe says to him, Pinchas, you want a bracha? You have to bring me a Mishloch Manot. Pinchas says, but Rebbe, how does one bring a Mishloch Manot to the Rebbe when one does not have any money? And the Rebbe said to him, Pinchas, when you came in here, you came over to me. He said, good Purim, Rebbe. Can I have a bracha? And Pinchas says, yeah. And the Rebbe says, that's not how you say good Purim. Pinchas says, okay, Rebbe. How do you say good Purim? And the Rebbe says, Pinchas, you have to dig deep. Deep inside yourself. Peel off all the layers of being a beggar. Connect with the deepest place of your neshama, of your soul, which is pure and always connected to God. And from that place, I want you to tell me good Purim. So Pinchas, he says, Rebbe... Maybe a great tzaddik like you can do something like that, but a poor beggar like me, I have no idea what you're talking about. So the Rebbe says, Pinchas, hang on a second. I want you to say to me, good poem like this. Rebbe, good poem! Pinchas is a little shocked. He says, Rebbe, when did you start drinking already? The Rebbe says, no. I told you, Pinchas. you got to dig deep. Now give me a good poem. So Pinchas, he thinks, okay, i got to dig deep. He says, Rebbe, good Purim! The Rebbe says, okay, that's a start, Pinchas. Do it again. This time, dig deeper. He says, Rebbe, good Purim! He says, yes, Pinchas, go deeper! He says, Rebbe, good Purim! The Rebbe says, yes, Pinchas. Now you know how to say good Purim. Now go out and get me a Mishloch Manot. And come back here, and I will bless you on the holy day of Purim. So Pinchas, he leaves the Rebbe Shul, feeling so confident like he's never felt in his whole life. He goes into the baker's shop. He says, Holy Baker! Good Purim! The baker looks at Pinchas. He says, Pinchas, what happened to you? He said, Baker, I'm collecting to give Mishlochei Mano to the Rebbe. I need some muffins. I need some cookies. I need some bread can put it on credit. I'll pay you back when I have the money. The baker's thinking to himself, put it on credit. Do you know how much you owe me, Pinchas? You have credit going back like 20 years already. But because of that good Purim and the confidence that Pinchas had, the baker fills up a basket with bread, and cookies, and muffins, and all kinds of delicacies. And he says, Pinchas, come here. He gives him a big kiss on the forehead. He says, thank you for making my Purim. And Pinchas, he walks out of the bakery feeling like he's never felt before. So confident, so joyous. Something has changed inside of him. He goes to the wine shop and he walks in and he says, Good Purim! The wine vendor, he says, Pinchas, good Purim to you, my friend. What's going on? What brings you here? He says, Holy winemaker, I need some wine for Purim. I'm giving a mishloch manot to the Rebbe, and I also need some wine for my family for the Suda, for the meal on Purim. Please put it on my credit, and I promise you I'll pay you back when I have the money. 
And the winemaker, he's thinking, yeah, Pinchas, you're going to pay me back when you have the money. You owe me for so much wine. Give me a break. But something had changed in Pinchas. And the winemaker, he takes several bottles of wine, puts them together. This is Pinchas, this is for you and your family and the Rebbe. And you don't owe me anything. It's on me. Pinchas, he leaves. He takes the baked goods, takes a bottle of wine. He comes back to the Rebbe and he walks in so confident. He says, Rebbe, good Purim! Shouts like a lion. The Rebbe says, Pinchas, come over here. You got it, my friend. Now give me a mishloch manot. Pinchas gives him a basket with a bottle of wine and some muffins and bread. And the Rebbe says, now Pinchas, I will give you a bracha. I'll give you a blessing. I bless you, Pinchas that you'd never forget the secret that you learned this year on Purim, and that your Purim goes higher and higher every day and every week and every year. And Pinchas is standing there crying because something happened to him. He was transformed. And he says, Rebbe, amen. Thank you, Rebbe. Thank you. Changed my life, Rebbe. The Rebbe says, Pinchas, get out there and share Purim with everyone. So Pinchas, he starts going from shop to shop, goes into the candle maker, comes in, he says, Good Purim! Candlemaker says, Shalom Aleichem, Pinchas. What's going on with you? Something's different. He said, The Rebbe gave me the gift of Purim, and I need some candles for my family. We're going to have a meal for Purim. Who can have a meal without candles on the table? The candlemaker says, Sure, Pinchas. Here you go, on the house. Pinchas walks into the tailor, and gets a new dress for his wife, gets clothes for his kids. He comes back home, and at home, Everyone's depressed. There's no food. There's no joy. It's the worst Purim ever. The kids are fighting. The mother's angry at the kids. She sees Pinchas. And she looks at him with one eye, thinking, Something's a little different about my Pinchas here. Pinchas, he walks into the room and he says, My wife and children, good Purim! The kids stop fighting. His wife has this huge smile on her face. And when he pulls out a dress for his wife, she says, Pinchas, what's going on? Pinchas says, come, let's quick. Let's set the table. We're having a suda. We're having a meal for Purim. And they put a tablecloth on the table. He puts the candles and lights them. He puts all the bread and muffins and cookies, the wine, all the things that he had picked up. And they're sitting there eating this beautiful meal, food like they've never eaten before. And Pinchas says to his wife and children, I want to teach you what the Rebbe taught me. He said, I'm not a beggar. He told me I'm a neshama. I'm a soul that's always connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, That's always connected to Hashem. And he said to me, give me good Purim from the place of your neshama. So come, my children and wife, let's shout good Purim from the deepest places in our heart and soul. And they all shout together. Good, good Purim! Purim! Good Purim! Back at the Suda, at the meal of the Kazan Magid, he says to his family and his Hasidim, Shh, everyone quiet down. They say, Rebbe, why? What's going on? He said, listen, listen carefully. In heaven, everyone has quieted down so they could hear the good Purim. Pinchas, the beggar, and all the Hasidim are quiet while they try to hear what the Rebbe is hearing. So Purim's over. And Pinchas thinks to himself, I'm going to start begging again. I can't be a beggar again. Not after the Rebbe taught me how to say good Purim. Pinchas says to Hashem, you know, Hashem, you make everything. You make the cows, you make the sun, and you make money. Money isn't even real. I mean, what is a ruble? It's just a coin or a piece of paper. And if you want, Hashem, you can send those coins and pieces of paper to me. And I don't have to be a beggar anymore. And after davening that morning, Pinchas goes to the richest Jew in town. And he walks into his house and he says, Good Purim! And the wealthy Jew says, Pinchas, first of all, I thought Purim was over. Pinchas says, Did you make Havdalah after Purim? The wealthy Jew says, No. He said, Neither did I. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm still in Purim. And I'll always be in Purim. And the wealthy Jew says, Well, Pinchas, sit down tell me what can I do for you. Pinchas says to the wealthy Jew, listen, the Rebbe gave me a bracha. He gave me confidence. He reminded me that I'm not a beggar, that I'm a neshama. And I asked Hashem that I should be successful in business. But I know it's not enough for me to just daven. I have to come and do something. 
So I'm coming to you. I want to borrow 10,000 rubles. And I want you to guide me in my business. And the wealthy Jew said, listen, Pinchas, with the confidence that you have and the street skills that you have, I'm going to give you 10,000 rubles and I'm going to help you. And just like the Rebbe had blessed Pinchas, his Purim got stronger and stronger from day to day and week to week. And by the next year, Pinchas was a wealthy Jew. He had paid off all of his debts. He was now helping other poor Jews. He was giving tzedakah. And when he walked into the Rebbe's shul and Purim, his good Purim was a thousand times stronger than the Rebbe had ever heard before. And the Rebbe blessed Pinchas that he should share his good Purim with all the Jews in the world so that they would know that they're not beggars, they're not doctors, they're not lawyers or teachers or accountants. They're neshamas, they're souls. And that the energy that's coming down on Purim allows us to reconnect with our soul, wipe off all the dirt that accumulated over all the years, and share that love, that connection with Hashem, with all of our fellow Jews. So may Hashem bless you, my sweetest friends, at this Purim. In every Purim, you not only be able to shout good Purim from the deepest depths of your soul, but that you find the place to see the good in all of your fellow Jews, that you can see so much good in your fellow Jews, that all you can say is Baruch Mordechai, is blessed is Mordechai, and not see any of the Aro Haman, cursed is Haman. And not just in your fellow Jews, my sweetest friends, but also in yourselves. Just like our teacher, Pinchas the beggar, taught us with his good poem. I told last year on Purim, and I figured not everybody's heard it, so it's good to hear it again. Reb Nissen was a wealthy Jew who lived near the town of Pressburg. And everybody knows that there was a famous yeshiva in Pressburg, the Pressburg Yeshiva, that was founded by the world-renowned rabbi and scholar, the Chassam Sofer. And even though Reb Nissen and his wife had been married for many years, it took them a long time until their first child was born. And when their son was born in 5583, 1823, no one was surprised that the Chassam Sofer was invited to do the bris milah, to do their circumcision. But every time the Hassam Sofer would check, he said he was worried about the baby's health and kept postponing the bris until finally the baby was healthy enough and the bris would take place on Purim. It was clear at the bris that the Hassam Sofer had a special light about him. And it wasn't just that today was Purim or that it was the student that finally gave birth to a son. No one was exactly sure what was going on, but something special was happening here. And after the Chassam Sofer completed the bris milah, he dipped his finger in the wine and placed it in the baby's mouth, which is the custom. But then he raised his voice very loudly and he said the Talmudic expression, that when wine goes in, the secrets come out. And this little baby boy was given a name appropriate for a poor bris, Baruch. Mordechai, which comes from one of the lines in the Megillah, that Mordechai be blessed. And as the child grew up, it was clear that he was a real mensch, that he davened sincerely, and that he could sit all day and learn Torah. But for some reason, he wasn't able to remember any of the Torah that he learned. And at his bar mitzvah, he entered the Pressburg Yeshiva, and even though he had been sitting there, learning all day long, learning from books and learning from the rabbis, Whenever he was asked to explain or repeat anything, he was completely silent. He couldn't remember anything. Some of his classmates decided to make fun of him. One time they took a Gemara that he was learning from and switched it with an entirely different Gemara, leaving it on the same page that he had been on before, but of course a different subject. And Baruch Mordechai sat down and continued learning as if nothing had happened at all. When he turned 18, the Chassab Sofer, who would replace his father, the Chassam Sofer, as the head of the yeshiva, advised the parents of Baruch Mordechai to send their son to the Holy Land, the land of Israel. It's said that the heir of the Holy Land makes one wise, and maybe then he'll be able to retain some of his Torah learning. And so after speaking with their son, Baruch Mordechai, they decided to send him to the Holy Land. And not just the Holy Land, but the Holy City of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. Baruch Mordechai arrived in Yerushalayim and he had a letter of recommendation from the Pressburg Yeshiva 
saying that he davens with great devotion and that he really sincerely wants to learn Torah and that he's a truly pious Jew. One of the rabbis in the Jerusalem community at the time, Rabbi Yeshaya Bardaki, he took a liking to Baruch Mordechai and adopted him like his own son. He took care of a place for him to live, took care of making sure that he had food and clothes and everything he needed. And Rabbi Yeshaya was very impressed with Baruch Mordechai's menschlichkeit and his davening, and he couldn't understand how somebody who had spent his entire life learning Torah couldn't remember anything. A couple of years later, when Baruch Mordechai reached the age of 20, Rabbi Yeshaya found a makala, a simple girl from a good family in Jerusalem, that wouldn't mind that her husband was an ignoramus. In the meantime, Baruch Mordechai sat and learned, but after a few years, he started to work as a water carrier, and he was so honest, he became very popular very quickly. Every Rosh Chodesh, he would bring the water to his regular customers for free, because he was worried that maybe during the previous month, a little bit of water had fallen out through the cracks in the buckets, and he had charged them for a full bucket. For more than 40 years, Baruch Mordechai worked as a water carrier in the old city of Jerusalem. And the whole time, he did it with true joy, besimcha, dancing, singing and whistling as he would carry the water. He said to himself, who in all of Jewish history gets the great schut to carry water in the holy city of Jerusalem? for the Jews and the Torah scholars living within these holy walls. And I get that schut. There was one rabbi, one great scholar, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Diskin, that refused to take any water from Baruch Mordechai. When people asked him, he said, I won't allow myself to take water from the likes of somebody like Rabbi Baruch Mordechai. People didn't understand it, but they accepted it. On Purim Day in 5653, it was 1893, during the Suda, the festive meal of the day of Purim. Most of the Hasidim and the great rabbis of the old city were crowded together like they did every year in the home of Rabbi Schneer Zalman Fradkin of Lublin, who was the author of Torah's Chesed. And it was more joyous than normal, even for a Purim celebration. Everybody was singing and dancing. And there was lots of wine in Divrei Torah. And all of a sudden, Baruch Mordechai shouts out and he says, Rebbe, today is 70 years since my bris mila. And everybody smiled. You know, the simple water carrier, he had something to say. Very nice. It must have been the wine that he was drinking on Purim. But Reb Schneer Zalman took it very seriously. He said, if that's the case, Baruch Mordechai, then you deserve an extra large lachaim. And immediately, a huge goblet with a special strong wine was poured and passed to Baruch Mordechai, who drank it down quickly. And right away, people could see that the wine was affecting Baruch Mordechai. He started swinging his arms in the air and dancing up and down and jumping, singing. And you got to remember that Baruch Mordechai at that point was 70 years old. And 70 years old in 1893 wasn't like 70 years old today. He was an old man. Everybody seeing him dancing and singing like this was very impressive. But Reb Shner Zalman, he looks at Baruch Mordechai and he says, shouting over the crowd, Baruch Mordechai, it would be nice if you stop fooling around and give us a few strong words of Torah. Don't we deserve it already? All of a sudden, the crowd quieted down and everybody turned their gaze to look at Baruch Mordechai as he climbed up on a table and started to speak, everybody had a look on their face like, ah, poor ignoramus. He never retained any Torah that he learned anyhow. But when they heard the words of Torah coming out of Baruch Mordechai's mouth, they were shocked. He was quoting from sources all over the place. He had memorized the entire tractate Megillah, all the Midrashim, Halachot, and he was going on and on and on. And if the wine hadn't made him pass out, it seemed like he would have gone on forever. Even before Purim was over, the news of the hidden tzaddik, Baruch Mordechai, started spreading around. The community didn't know what to do. How had they let such a great scholar carry water for 40 years? And not only that, nobody had learned from Baruch Mordechai. He wasn't given the opportunity to teach. Everyone had made fun of him. Everyone, that is, except for Rabbi Yehuda Leib Diskin, who obviously knew better. And there were a few elders in the community 
who remembered the words of the Hassam Sofer from 70 years before. And now people were saying, now we understand what the Hassam Sofer was saying. When the Hassam Sofer said at the bris of Baruch Mordechai, Nichnas Yayin, Yotze Sod, when wine enters, the secrets come out, Yayin, spelled Yud Yud Nun, has a gematria, or a numerical value, of 70, and so does Samech Vav Daled, which is the word for secret. So the blessing that the Hassam Sofer gave, the little baby, Baruch Mordechai des Bris, was that he would be able to retain all of the Torah that he learned his whole life, but not be made proud by his Torah learning and be able to avoid honor, kavod, so that his Torah learning could be sincere and truly for the sake of heaven. It was the greatest bracha that he could have been given, even though he had suffered embarrassment and people had made fun of him most of his life. He merited to serve Hashem as a simple Jew, even though he was such a great Torah scholar. And of course, from that point on, in the community in Jerusalem, Baruch Mordechai was asked to teach a daily lesson, and he did, but only after he finished his rounds carrying the water. Thank you so much for listening, my sweetest friends. I hope you have a beautiful, powerful, deep, and meaningful Purim. That you reach a place on Purim that's higher than the Ela on Yom Kippurim. And I want to wish a Mazel Tov to the granddaughter of one of the supporters of this podcast, Malka Morovich, who's having her Bat Mitzvah on the 16th of Adar. Should be B'Sha'a Tova and Mazel Tov. And may she and her family and their parents and grandparents and all of you Grow up to Torah, Chupa, and Masim Tovim. To be able to learn Torah with joy, to get married and have families, and to do mitzvot and good deeds. Always besimcha, always with joy. And Be'ezat Hashem, also in good health. Thank you again for listening. I hope you have the sweetest Purim, my sweetest friends. And until then, good Today is Tanit Esther, the fast of Esther, before the great holiday of Purim, which in most of the world starts tonight, but here in the holy city of Jerusalem, starts on Tuesday night. So Bezat Hashem, I'll have success in telling the story, and recording the story, and getting it up in time for this week's podcast. So here's one more story for Purim. Mendel was a successful businessman, and he had business dealings in Romania, in Russia, and eventually he moved to Kishinev. And because of his success and because he was a kind person, he had many friends, Jews and non-Jews, and many business partners. I mean, I'm sure you know how it works, my sweetest friends, back in the old days. A non-Jew could simply accuse a Jew of a crime, and most likely the Jew would lose the court case. Because Jews didn't have rights. Now we do, but back then we didn't. And there was one business partner who decided that he didn't like Mendel, for whatever reason. And he went to the Romanian government, and he told them, You know, Mendel, the Jew, the wealthy one who's so successful in business. Well, let me tell you how he became so successful. He once found a box of gold coins when he was in Romania that had the seal of the government on the box. And he looked left, and he looked right, and he saw that nobody was looking. And he stole the money. And that's why he left Romania to move to Russia. 
And the Romanian government, when they heard about this, they didn't even bother looking into the facts, seeing if anything here was true or not. They said, ah, Jews stole our money. It's good enough for us. And so they said, we want to put Mendel on trial. Realizing that Mendel had left Romania, they had to contact the Tsar in Russia and ask him to extradite Mendel to Romania so he could stand trial. But the Russian government didn't like this. They had their pride. They didn't really care about Mendel, but they cared about Russia. And they said, listen, this Mendel is now a Russian, and we're not going to send him to Romania. If you want to have a trial, you're going to have to come here to Kishinev and conduct it on Russian soil. So the Romanian government agreed, and the court date was set, and Mendel was served with a court summons to appear for his trial for stealing money from the Romanian government. Mendel looks at the letter, and he says, steal money from the Romanian government? I never stole money from anyone or anything. He looks at his wife, and he says, what is this? She says, my husband, you know exactly who to go to. Go to the Rebbe, the Spoiler Zaidi, and ask him for help. Now, if you're a fan of the podcast, my sweetest friends, you'll know that I told two stories about the Spoiler Zaidi. The first about how he got his name from the Heilige Baal Shem Tov, and the second about the dancing Rebbe. So make sure you listen to those stories 182 and 183. So Mendel, the businessman that comes to the Spoiler Zaidi, he says to him, Rebbe, look at the court summons. I never stole any money from anyone. I certainly didn't steal from the Romanian government. And the Spoiler Zaidi said, listen, Mendel, you have nothing to worry about. Just tell them that you have to delay the court case until Purim, and don't hire a lawyer. Just show up, and I'll make sure that an excellent lawyer comes to defend you. So Mendel says, thank you, Rebbe. That's wonderful. How much is the lawyer going to cost me? And the Rebbe says, well, there's an orphaned bride who's going to get married soon, and she has no money for her wedding. I want you to give me 300 rubles for the wedding, and I'll take care of the lawyer. So Mendel says, Rebbe, you want me to give tzedakah and not pay a lawyer? And you're going to send me the lawyer? He says, exactly, Mendel. You're very good at this, Mendel. And on top of that, I want you to prepare a document to bring to the lawyer that shows that he's the one representing you. And when you get to court, you're going to recognize the lawyer because he's going to be wearing a white hat and red gloves. And you give him the power of attorney. And you make sure that he speaks on your behalf. So Mendel felt that the Rebbe was very confident in what he said, and apparently he knows what he's talking about. So he gives the 300 rubles for the orphan bride. And he goes home. He starts contacting people, trying to get the court date moved. It wasn't easy, but eventually he moved it to Purim itself. And the court date was scheduled for Purim afternoon at 3 o'clock. Now it takes a real chassid to show up to court without a lawyer, without preparing anything, and completely trust in the Rebbe. And Mendel, as much as he wanted to have complete faith in the Rebbe, it wasn't so easy. And he sent a letter to the Spoiler Zaidi, asking him to give him a blessing for success. And he also sent more money for Matanot Lev Yonim, for gifts for the poor on Purim. Purim arrives, and in the court of the Shpola Zaidi, everyone was very happy. The children showed up in costumes. People were going back and forth, handing out Mishlochei Manot, Shlachmanas, the food gifts that we give one another on Purim. People were handing out tzedakah, Matanot Lev Yonim. And in the afternoon, the Shpola Zaidi gathered a group of his Hasidim at home, but it was only his closest Hasidim that he allowed to come in. And for everyone else, he locked the door and put two Hasidim at the front of the door to make sure that nobody came in. Now everybody knows that Purim is a very special day. It's said that all of the holidays, when Mashiach comes, will no longer be celebrated. Because with the light of Mashiach, we won't need those holidays to connect with Hashem. But the light of Purim is even higher than Mashiach. That's why the holiday of Purim is going to remain. So you can imagine, my sweetest friends, how much power there is on Purim. And of course, the Shpoler Zaidi knew this. One of the things that he liked to do on Purim was put on plays where everybody would laugh and make fun. But the truth is, they knew that the Rebbe was passing judgment on accusations that were being made in heaven against the Jewish people. And this year, like four more years, the Shpoler Zaidi said to his Hasidim, we are now going to have a court case. And the Hasidim were very excited. The Rebbe points to one of his Hasidim and he says, Ancho, you're going to be the chief justice. Then he points to two other Hasidim, saying, you will be the other two judges on the court. And then he says, Velvo, you are going to be the prosecutor from the Romanian government. Now go and color your face green. He went and put green makeup all over his face. And when he walked back in, he looked so ridiculous. Everybody just started laughing. <laughs> 
And the Schmoller's Zadi said, and I'm going to be the lawyer of the Jewish defendant. And he took a white handkerchief and put it on top of his strimal and then put on red silk gloves. And then he turned to one of his other Hasidim. He said, Moishi, you're going to be Mandel the Jew. And you, he turned to another one of his Hasidim and said, you are going to be the informer. And then he picked two witnesses that would defend the Jew. And he said, okay, court is in session. And the chief justice begins to read the accusations against Mendel the Jew. He says, this Jew is a very wealthy and successful businessman. But it turns out that he's successful because he stole money from the Romanian government. And then the chief justice turns to the guy with the green face prosecutor from the Romanian government and says, what evidence do you have? And he looks so ridiculous, everybody started laughing again. He said, I have an informer. And the informer is brought up and he says, Mendel here, he found a box with the royal treasure seal on it. He stole it and fled to Russia. That's why he's so wealthy. And then the witnesses were brought up and they accused the informer. They said, oh, he's just jealous. Mendel never stole any money. This guy once came to Mendel and asked to borrow a large sum of money. And since Mendel didn't want to lend it to him, he said he would take revenge. Then the chief justice says to the lawyer, okay, what do you have to say? And the Shpola Zaidi, he gets up and he says, the informer says what he says because he's jealous. He just wants to take revenge on my client. But it's not true. Even if Mendel did find a box like that, the Romanian government has no right to demand it from him. And he went on to explain the law and what happens with lost money and returning the lost money. When he finished, the three judges decreed unanimously with big smiles, we declare that Mendel the Jew is innocent of all charges. Innocent, innocent, innocent. And that was a great deal of fun and everybody laughed. <laughs> The court case was over and they had the Suda for Purim, the meal for Purim, and everybody sat there and drank and laughed and shared Divrei Torah, blessed one another, and went higher and higher in their Purim. And a few days later, Mendel shows up. And the Hasidim said, hey, Mendel, we had a fake court case for you. Mendel said, really? They said, yeah, we declared you innocent. He said, really? He said, yeah, Mendel, but what really happened? He said, well, I had an excellent lawyer. And the Hasidim said, really, what did your lawyer say? And word for word, everything that the Shpoler Zaidi said, the lawyer said. The Hasidim were in shock. Everything that happened in the actual court was a reflection of what happened in the mock courthouse in the Shpoler Zaidi's room. So when Mendel entered the Rebbe's room, the Shpoler Zaidi says to him, No, I sent you a good lawyer, didn't I? And Mendel says, yeah. Everybody was amazed. They never heard such a good lawyer as him. And thanks to him, I was declared innocent, Rebbe. You sent me the best defense lawyer. And the Rebbe said, Mendel, you should know that this defense lawyer was actually Eliyahu Navi, was actually Elijah the prophet, who was sent down from heaven to defend you in the merit of the tzedakah that you gave for the orphan bride who got married before your court case. Because you were willing to have faith in the Rebbe and faith in Hashem, you married it to be saved with the most special lawyer anyone could ever ask for. And I promise you, Mendel, if you continue giving tzedakah and helping your fellow Jews, you will see that when the day comes that you reach the world to come, that same lawyer will stand in front of the heavenly court and defend you any accusations placed against you. I la 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 So I have one more short story for you. Throughout the month of Adar, the great Rebbe, Reb Shmuel Abba of Zichlin, was always extra specially happy. And on Purim, his simcha, his joy, was so great that it was like fireworks going off all the time. There were some people that didn't treat Purim as a serious holy day to be seriously happy on a seriously holy day. And if people didn't come dressed in their Shabbos clothes in honor of the Megillah reading, Shmuel Abba told them they weren't okay. In one year, his base Midrash, the shul was filled with all the people that had come to hear the Megillah and everybody being Hasidim of Shmuel Abba. They knew to wear their best Shabbos clothes, except there was one guy who showed up in his weekday clothes. Some of the Hasidim said to him, What are you doing? Don't you know that it's Purim? And the man answered, making a play on a common Yiddish folk expression, Purim is not a Yom Tov, and fever is not a sickness. Meaning that, you get a fever, it doesn't mean that you're seriously sick. And Purim, 
Eh, it's a minor holiday. It's not really a Yom Tov, so I don't have to wear my Shabbos clothes. At that moment, the tzaddik entered and looked at this chassid who was wearing his weekday clothes. And he said to him, Purim is a Yom Tov, and fever is a sickness. And as soon as that chassid got home that night, he got a fever. And it got worse and worse as the days went on. The chassid realized this wasn't just any fever. And he sent a message through his family to ask the Rebbe for a bracha to heal. And Reb Shmuel Abba said, now he knows that a fever is really a sickness. And hopefully he will understand now that Purim is really a Yom Tov. This poor chassid suffered from a fever the entire year until the next Purim, when he showed up in his best Shabbos clothes. And at that point, his fever went away, and he understood that a fever is a sickness, and that Purim really is a Yom Tov. I bless you all, my sweetest friends, and bless me back, that Hashem opens all the gates of heaven for us. One of the secrets for Purim is to daven for your fellow Jews. So wherever you go, make sure you bless people. They can bless you back. And if you do that, I promise you, you will have a high, high Purim. Remember, the mitzvah is not to get drunk on alcohol. It's to get drunk on Purim. You have to get to the point, Adeloyada, that you can't tell the difference between blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman. That means that every time you see a Jew, you don't see anything bad in them. You only see the good in them. And when you see the good and you bless the good, Hashem will elevate you and your fellow Jews to a place higher than any place you could reach on any other Yom Tov. Since I'm telling the story just before Purim, I wanted to share two stories connected to Amalek. And before I start, I have to explain what is the significance of Amalek. So Amalek was a tribe in biblical times who went and attacked the Jewish people after they had left Egypt. And you would think, well, what's the big deal? People attack people all the time. Nations attack nations all the time. But here, the nation of Amalek and everybody in the ancient world had heard or seen the miracles that Hashem had done openly for the Jewish people when they left Egypt. And to come and attack the Jewish people after they were openly, miraculously taken out of the deepest, darkest places of Egypt meant that the tribe of Amalek was essentially saying, we don't believe in God. We don't believe in the significance of the Jewish people and their connection to God. And so Amalek is symbolic of always the nations that attack the Jews, and Haman, who of course is the villain, the Book of Esther is said to be a descendant of Amalek, and also the negative energy in the world that brings about doubt, because the numeric value, the gematria, of Amalek is safek, which means doubt. And what does that mean? That means that when we have questions, when we're doubting, should I keep kosher? Should I wear a kippah? Should I keep Shabbos? Should I identify as a Jew? All of those questions are coming from a place of Amalek. And on the holiday of Purim, we wipe out Amalek. And how do we do that? by overcoming those fears, by getting high, not on alcohol or drugs, but on the holiday itself, on the energy that's coming down on the holiday of Purim itself. And when we connect with that energy and overcome our doubts and embrace our Judaism, that's when we defeat Amalek. So here are two stories somewhat related to this concept. There was an Orthodox Jew from somewhere in New Jersey who had accidentally killed an old non-Jewish man in a car accident. And even though the courts found him to be not guilty because it wasn't intentional at all, he couldn't get rid of the pain that he felt and the guilt that he felt for killing another person. 
and he couldn't sleep and he couldn't eat and he was really falling apart and he didn't know what to do. So he decided to send a letter to the great rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky in Bnei Brak and ask him for a tikkun, for how to do tshuva, how to fix the damage that had been done to his soul by accidentally killing this old man. And when the rabbi wrote back to him, he wrote one word, and the word was Amalek. And that's it. He didn't say anything else. And unfortunately for this Jew in New Jersey, it didn't give him any comfort. He didn't understand the answer, and he continued not being able to eat and sleep. So at some point, this Jew in New Jersey, he decided he just had to move to a new town. And maybe, you know as they say, when you change your place, your luck changes, your fortune changes. So he thought maybe if he moved to a new town, he'd be able to stop thinking about the accident. And so he started looking for a new house, and he found a house not so far away from where he lived before that he liked. And the owners were very eager to sell the house because it was an inheritance from their father who had passed away recently in a car accident. So this Jew started asking them, tell me some details about this car accident. How old was your father? And they started telling the type of car he drove, when it happened and how it happened. And this Jew realized that this house belonged to the old man that he had accidentally killed. And he was besides himself. And he, of course, didn't say anything to the family, but he figured, okay, now he's in the house of the man that he killed. Accidentally, of course. Maybe he could learn something more about him. Maybe it would make him feel a little better. At least he knew who this man was. And he asked the family if it would be okay if he walked around the house and checked it out. And they said, yes, of course. He went from room to room. And then he went into the basement of the house. He goes down the stairs. And he sees there's a box. And it's half open. And it has all kinds of things in it, including photographs. And he goes and looks at the pictures. And he sees a picture of the old man that he had accidentally killed when he was a young man, proudly wearing an SS uniform of the Nazis in Achshemam, standing right next to Hitler with a big smile on his face. It turned out that this old man had been an officer in the Nazi army during the Holocaust. And after the war, he escaped to the United States and hid his past. Not only had he been a Nazi, but he had made a list of names of all the Jews that he had killed himself. Chas v'shalom. And so this Jew, he takes the list and starts reading over all the names. And on the list of names, he finds the names of both of his parents on the list. And then he understood why Rabbi Kanievsky had sent him that one word answer, Amalek, because it's true that the old man had been killed by accident. But it was Hashkacha Pratit, divine intervention, that Hashem brought it about that the son would be able to avenge the murder of his parents by this old man who had once been a Nazi and escaped to America. <laughs> Herschel was one of the wealthiest Jews that lived in his area. And even though he was so wealthy, he remained a very simple and modest person. He didn't wear fancy clothes. He didn't have fancy parties. And he remained very down to earth. And it was known that Herschel was the manager of the nobleman who owned all of the real estate, the entire region in which he lived. And everyone referred to him as Herschel, the manager, because he managed all of the real estate of the nobleman. And of course, nobody likes to have to pay rent or taxes. And so because part of his responsibility was collecting the rent and taxes, the Jewish community didn't like Herschel so much. But because he was such a kind and warm person, he was very popular in the Jewish community. And one of the reasons was because of his very unique background. You see, Herschel used to be a simple wagon driver. He never had much money, could barely make ends meet. And one day... 
After a bris, where Herschel was asked to be the sandak to hold the baby during the circumcision, the father of the child asked Herschel to please stand up and tell everyone how did he become so wealthy? How did he go from rags to riches? And Herschel was a little nervous, kind of moved around in his chair. And he said, no, nobody wants to hear my story. But everyone in the crowd said, yes, yes, we want to hear your story, Herschel, please. We want to know, how did you end up with such good fortune? They poured Herschel a big l'chaim. He took a little sip. He got up in front of the crowd and told them his story. He said, once when I was a wagon driver, there was a terrible storm. Rain was coming down all over the place. It was so hard, I could barely see in front of me. Lightning was striking left and right. And the winds were going to knock over my horses and myself. Everyone was smart and they were staying at home. They'd locked their doors and closed their windows. But I had already obligated myself to a powerful nobleman to deliver a wagon of goods to a faraway place. And I knew that if I delayed another day, could be that the nobleman would be more dangerous to me than the weather. And so feeling that I didn't have any choice, I decided to go forward in the storm. At first I drove slowly, but it wasn't just the rain. All of the roads had turned to mud. And it's lucky for me that the wagon didn't sink, or an axle or a wheel broke. But I just kept going slowly for a few hours. And then I see in front of me, on the side of the road, it was clearly a Jewish man with a big beard, and he was completely soaked from head to toe, and his clothes were so dirty with mud, it was as if he was made of mud. So I slowed down and pulled over, and I said, Shalom Aleichem, my sweetest friend, what are you doing out here in the rain? And as I got closer to the man, I was shocked to see that it was the Sasov a Rebbe, Reb Moshe Leib of Sasov. I said to him, Rebbe, quick, get on the wagon. The Rebbe climbed on. And I tried to get the water and mud off of his clothes. The Rebbe was just staring at me, as if I was an angel that came out of heaven. And I was staring at him, trying to understand, what is the Rebbe doing standing in the middle of a storm on the side of the road? What's he doing here? And so the Rebbe told me that he had made a promise to himself to go and visit his parents in the town of Brod, where they lived. And every now and then, like this time, when it came time to visit, he realized that he didn't have any money. And so he had no choice. He couldn't hire a wagon. He didn't have a horse. So he had to walk from Sasov to Brot. In the morning when he left, the weather seemed fine. But then a little storm started. And then it was getting worse and worse. But he had already gone more than halfway of the distance. And he figured, I'm doing a mitzvah. And once I've started, I'm not going to stop. So the Rebbe said to me, What are you doing here? Why are you driving in the middle of a storm? And I told him I had taken a job from this nobleman. And I realized that the nobleman might kill me if I don't do the job. So I figured the nobleman might be worse than the storm. And I started driving in the storm, despite the weather. So the Rebbe says to him, how much money are you going to make from this job? And when I told him, the Rebbe said, I'll pay you even more. Just please take me first to Brod. Even though, of course, the Rebbe didn't have any money at the time. But Herschel had already decided that he was taking the Rebbe to Brod for free. Of course, he wasn't going to charge him. And he already pulled the horses in the direction towards Brod. And the truth is, the journey was very difficult. And there were many times when Herschel thought that he wasn't going to make it. But finally, with Hashem's help, they arrived a few days later. And then the weather improved, and Herschel went and made his delivery. And then he came back to Brod, picked up the Rebbe, and brought him back to Sasov. When they arrived, the Rebbe said, Please, I want to pay you like I had promised you. But Herschel didn't have any intention of taking money from a Rebbe especially when he's standing on the side of the road in a storm like that, on his way to do such a great mitzvah as honoring your parents. But of course Herschel knew that the Rebbe was going to insist that he pays. And Herschel waited, refusing to accept the pay, until finally the Rebbe said, So fine, you won't take money. What can I give you? And Herschel then got what he wanted. And he said, Rebbe, all I want is a bracha from you. All I want is a blessing from the Rebbe. And so the Rebbe thinks for a few minutes, and then he says, what do you own? And Herschel didn't understand the question. He said, Rebbe, what do you mean? He said, what possessions do you have? What do you own? And so I said to the Rebbe, I have these two horses. And then the Rebbe closes his eyes and meditates for a minute. And he opens his eyes and he says, well, you have two horses. He said, yes, Rebbe, I told you, I have two horses. 
He said, wonderful. One horse for Purim and the other for Pesach. So Herschel says, Rebbe, is that a bracha? And the Rebbe says, indeed, indeed. It is definitely a bracha. But Rebbe, I don't understand. One for Purim and one for Pesach. What are you talking about? And the Rebbe said, ah, you will see, my friend. You will see. And so Herschel left the Rebbe. And a few weeks passed and it was getting close to Purim. And a couple of days before the holiday started, one of the horses became ill and it died. <laughs> and Herschel was very upset. Now, he could still sell the carcass of the horse and get some money from it. And it was enough money to pay for Purim. But it wasn't a blessing because now one of his two horses was dead. And how was he supposed to make a living with only one horse? And three weeks later, the week before Pesach, the second horse got sick and died. <laughs> and Herschel is besides himself. Both of his horses died. He didn't have any money. He didn't have a way to make a living. He sold the body of the dead horse. And he made just enough money to pay for Pesach. But once the holiday of Passover was over, he had no way of making a living. And he's sitting there after Pesach saying to his wife, The Rebbe said one horse for Purim and one for Pesach. Well, apparently he meant one's going to die before Purim so we can pay for Purim. And one's going to die before Pesach so we can have the money to pay for Pesach. But then what? So Herschel's wife says, go to the Rebbe and ask him. And so I come to the Rebbe. I say, Rebbe, you're a true prophet. Everything worked out the way that you said. One horse died before Purim, and the other died before Pesach. But Rebbe, I came to you for a bracha. I came for a blessing, not a curse. Now that my horses are dead, how am I supposed to make a living? And the Rebbe looked at me with a big smile, and I could see his eyes were sparkling. And he said, yes, it is a bracha. One for Purim and one for Pesach. But Rebbe, how is this possibly a blessing when everything has been taken away from me? And the Rebbe said, everything has been taken away from you? And Herschel said, yeah, you took my two horses away from me. And the Rebbe said, no, Herschel, you don't understand. Everything has been given to you. And Herschel said, Rebbe, I'm sorry, I don't understand. The Rebbe said, Herschel, you have been given the gift of Emuna. You've been given the gift of total trust in Hashem. And now it's up to Hashem to fulfill the bracha, the blessing. And Herschel said, I have to admit that I didn't understand how there was a blessing in this. And so I said to the Rebbe, please, I don't want to leave here without understanding what's going on. And the Rebbe said, Herschel, I'm so envious of you. I never had a test like this. Herschel said, a test like what? He said, a test of total faith, like yours. Now go, Herschel, and come back here when the blessing has come true. And so Herschel left the Rebbe, not having any money, not having a horse. And he's walking from town to town on his way back home. And he passes by an inn, goes to spend the night, and he hears two Jews are talking with one another. They're talking about a nobleman, a very wealthy nobleman, that owns a lot of property, and that he can't find anyone to manage his property. Everyone he hires disappoints him. And these two Jews were once his managers, but they couldn't get along with the nobleman. So Herschel says to them, who is this nobleman and where does he live? And they said to him, why, you have experience in managing property? He said, no, but I have a bracha from the Rebbe. These two Jews thought it was very funny, but they figured, okay, this Herschel here, he's not so smart. So we'll take him to the nobleman and let the nobleman chop him up into mincemeat. And so the two Jews brought him to the count, to the nobleman, and he says to Herschel, tell me, Herschel, you have experience managing property? And Herschel said, no. But I have a bracha from the Rebbe. And the nobleman said, you know what? If you buy one of my properties, you can lease it out and make some money. And I'll see if you do a good job. Maybe I'll hire you to manage some other property. And Herschel says to the nobleman, but I don't have any money to rent your property. And the nobleman is thinking to himself, you know, this Herschel seems like a nice guy. And I can't seem to find anyone to manage my property. So he says to him, you know what, Herschel? I'm going to lend you the money for the first year. And let's see how you do managing my property. And if things work out, I'll give you more property to manage. And you'll pay me back eventually. And it turned out that Herschel and the nobleman got along very well. And he was able to make a nice living managing the property. And the nobleman gave him more and more property to manage. Until eventually, Herschel became a wealthy man. And he went back to the Rebbe. And he said, Rebbe, I'm not sure if this was your intention but I became the manager of a huge amount of property for the nobleman where I live. And the Rebbe says, yes, 
That's the blessing. One for Purim and one for Pesach. It was decreed in heaven that you would no longer be a wagon driver, that it was time for you to become rich. And all that was needed was to take you out of where you were so stuck and allow you to have faith in Hashem so that you could be given what was always meant to be yours. And so Herschel turned to everyone at the Brit Milah, where he was speaking, and he said, So you see, my sweetest friends, it's true that I have a lot of money, but the reason that I don't have a big ego is because I know that it's only a result of the Rebbe's bracha. It's only a result of it being decreed in heaven that I no longer be a wagon driver and that I be a wealthy Jew. But I know that any money that I have isn't from the work of my own hands. It's from the blessings that came from the Rebbe and from Hashem himself. If you made it this far, my sweetest friends, I'm very impressed. It's a lot of stories. Thank you again for listening, and thank you for all of your support. And next week, there's not the shim. Somehow, after Purim, I'll be recording some more stories. So we'll meet again then. Take care, my sweetest friends. Zai gesund.